the eternal past and new beginnings. We're looking at God's view of uh, eternity. We're looking at, uh, in specifics, particularly from next week, we're going to be looking at God creating the uh, earth, this earth, in six uh, days. The evening and the morning were the first day. I will be going through that in a lot of detail for next week to harmonize that the Bible speaks about an old earth and a, non, and a young earth at the same time. Actually, the, 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 the Bible is not inconsistent with science in so many ways, and science isn't inconsistent with the Bible in so many ways. And I'm going to try and bring some of these things together. Uh, some of it, some of you have seen before, um, others of you brand new. So I've actually uh, broken it down into bite-sized chunks, although last week was quite a big one. It was the introduction, and we went from eternity past all the way to eternity future, went through all the stages of, of uh, God's view of the ages or his plan of the ages on the earth. And, uh, but tonight will be probably a little bit shorter, hopefully a bit more uh, memorable, um, but we'll see how we go. But it's still very much concepts, uh, bringing some concepts to you, which I think everybody knows more or less anyway, but it's good to refresh because next week we get into the really serious stuff and it will help if you've got some of these concepts. So my aim is, uh, my plan is to unfold for you particularly the beginnings of the earth, the plan that God had for planet Earth, where it's come from, what it is now, we know where it's going. What I mean by God's plan of the ages or the eternal Earth or whatever uh, terminology you want to use is that God saw absolutely everything in his foreknowledge. He's that big. We've been singing about uh, a massive God, okay? And today we're going to be trying to put him much more in context and lift him uh, to the place that he, he truly is. Uh, but, but God, in his foreknowledge, he saw everything that would happen in eternity before anything was even made. Does, I mean, that blows my mind. Uh, and that's what we call God's foreknowledge. He is, he is all-knowing, always has been knowing, and he knows the future. And of course, he knows everything that's gone on in the past. So God, I hope you know, is actually out, outside of time and space. Time and space do not affect him. God is an eternal being, and uh, he exists in the realm of eternity. We, on the other hand, we are created beings, and we are created by God, and we are uh, God's creation, and in the creation, there is this strange thing called time. Okay, in God's eternity, there is no time. He's outside of time. He's outside of space. Uh, but in the creation, that's when we all know very well about time. We read many times in Genesis chapter 1, when God created the earth, we read this phrase many times. In fact, at the end of each day of the creation, the evening and the morning was the first day. Very, very specific. Did God really want us to understand within our concept of time, we live in time. The evening and the morning is the Jewish day. In Greek time, the morning to the evening is, 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 is our day. But did God really want to expose to us how he made the creation within our own time frame? Or is this just lovely poetry? The evening and the morning were the first day. Was it billions of years that God's really talking about? And this is where next week really unpacks that um, in some, uh, some great detail. But in the creation, there is time. And time is a thing that God has made within this creation. So time, as we know, is our existence, is it not? We are the product of living through time. My joints know that I have lived quite a long time because, boy, they're really starting to ache and hurt. And we are bound by time. We are limited by time. And, of course, God isn't. And, of course, the, the button... 
a, a lot of the Bible, not all of the Bible, but a lot of the Bible is the account of the earth's time. It's the account of its past, and that's what we would call history. It's present, that's what we're living in now, and of its future. And all that God has seen will come to pass. Surprisingly, uh, we can see as we go through this, there is a sketchiness hidden within the Bible. It's not hidden, it's there for us to see, but we have to piece it together. But the Bible is quite sketchy about the earth in its past, i.e. what happened to earth before Genesis chapter 1.1. 1, 1. The Bible actually gives a picture and, and, and gives us the picture, but we have to delve into Scripture to see exactly what was going on, and that's when it gets really interesting. In fact, there seems to be in Scripture much more said in the Bible about the eternal earth to come. There will be a new heaven, there will be a new earth. We know what's going to happen. There's, there's, there's lots of things that build up towards the end of this earth. And we know that God's judgment comes. There's an awful lot said about God's judgment. We know about the millennial kingdom. There's a lot said about this. And so quite a lot is said in the Bible about the future of the earth. But what I wanted to look at in this series particularly is the stuff which we don't readily pick up when we read Scripture. It's kind of scattered through Jeremiah, Isaiah, the Psalms. It's, it needs piecing together. It's there in 2 Peter quite a lot. It needs piecing together. And then we see an amazing picture about the origins of the earth. And can we harmonize a six-day creation with the earth being 14 billion years old, as the scientists say? Well, you know that that's my aim, and I believe that I can do it from the Bible. But tonight we're looking at concepts, we're thinking a lot about time, so let's have a... It's not working, David. You've got... It is working, but um, I think David's using his clicker and he needs to transfer me to my clicker, which... Um... Yeah, I've got a red light, I'm on. That's nice to know, isn't it? That's a laser, by the way, that's a laser pen. Amazing. Anyway, so let's look at Genesis chapter 1. The whole of the Bible is profound, and you know this. Uh, Genesis uh, chapter 1 is one of the most profound writings of the Bible ever. Why? Mainly because only God was there in the beginning. So God dictated and wrote Genesis chapter 1 to the prophet Moses. These are precisely God's words, and boy does he say an awful lot in Genesis chapter 1. The skill of a very intelligent person is they can say so much in such a short sentence. We're going to see that by how God has written um, his verse, first verse. So we enter, we enter the story of eternity at a particular point. We enter it at the beginning of our book, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, and we read, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It's a very simple sentence, but it's a very powerful sentence. We looked a bit at this last week. In that one sentence, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. There are a trinity of scientific principles that are very important particularly to us, and they are time, space, and matter. And they're all related in some way. It is the realm of physics, quantum physics, and Einstein, and many a scientist has spent their whole career looking into the, into the depths of this one sentence because it's describing time, space, and, ma and matter. So let's think about Genesis 1.1 and what it's really saying. And, I said this last week in a slightly different way, but if we say it more than once, this one I think you can remember. It's only three things to remember. So here we go. It's not going to work, David. David anticipated that, so we're swapping clickers. Thank you. That's better. So in the beginning is time. Time, past, present and future, God created it all. Our time has a beginning, a middle, and an end. 
time is, has to have a beginning. Time is something, as we will see, which has started and continues within the created order. So in the beginning, God has created time in the beginning. And then God created the heavens. Well, I think this is a description of God creating space. Space has width, depth, and height. As I showed you last week, the universe is absolutely massive. God, in that space, as we know when we read Scripture, created three heavens. Were you aware of the three heavens of Scripture? The first heaven is the atmosphere. We fly a plane in the first heaven, and birds fly in the first heaven. And in a way, we are living within that first heaven. We are breathing the atmosphere. The second heaven is that universe outside of the earth, outside the boundaries of our own planet, going out into space. And uh, the second heaven, that is what we call space. And then we get this third heaven. What is the third heaven? And that's the place where God is. That is where God dwells, because as we've said, God is outside of time. He is an eternal creature. Uh, he's also not a created creature. He is a spirit, and we know all of these things. And so uh, the third heaven is where God is. And there's a description of what this third heaven is, because that's where Paul went, and that's where the apostle John went, uh, where he saw into the things of the future of Revelation. And so the Bible seems to be describing the circumstances of our planet, the circumstances of the universe, but points again that God is outside of it all. He's outside of time, he's outside of our space, and that seems to me what the um, Bible is saying. And then he created the earth. And earth is matter, isn't it? It's substance. Uh, you and I are matter. I mean, we know that Adam and Eve have come from the, uh, the, the ground of the earth, and, and Eve came from Adam's rib. And so there's a great uh, symbiotic relationship for us with this creation. So the earth is matter. So Genesis 1 1 is describing space, both time, space, and matter. But it's also, if you notice, in the beginning, God. You know, God does not have to justify who he is. God is God. And he doesn't have to explain who he is. He just states who he is. And there's an expectation that we will see through the created order that there must be a creator. That we will believe that there is a God. So God does not have to justify himself. But this is the point at which we enter the Bible, Genesis 1.1. Was there anything happening before this point in our time? This is our time. This is our earth. This is the history of our earth, which I was showing uh, to you from archaeology and all other sorts of ways that the Bible adds up this present earth to be about 10,000 years. Was there anything happening to this planet before this point of entry that we arrive in our story. And, uh, you know, good books, they start with an eye-catching sentence, and this really draws us in. But also, really good books, they have some surprises. They have things that are, are hidden that you discover in your journey as you get to see the Bible. And so next week is when we really start to delve into, was there anything before Genesis 1-1? And I'm going to tell you, yes, there was. And it is quite substantial. Even though the Bible is quite sketchy, when you piece it all together, it says quite a lot about what Peter would call the ancient world that then was. Ancient meaning before Genesis 1.1, before Adam and before Eve. Something the Bible describes is happening, and it's important for us to see it, because when we do see it, it kind of brings everything into perspective. God says a lot in a very short 
sentence. But let's think about what is time. It's very important to us. What is time? And actually, it's very important in Genesis 1.1 because God has introduced us to time and he uses time in the creation. But was that just a myth or did he mean it literally? Did it really happen in the way he said it did or not? And of course, I'm more of a literalist and I'm going to show you next week that he did mean it in the way he wrote it. But when we think about time, time is simply direction. It marches in a direction. It's moving forward like walking in a straight line. And time is duration. It's direction and duration. It's always moving forward like the hands on a clock. And biblical time has a beginning and it's going somewhere. It is marching towards something. In fact, biblical time is marching towards time eternity, when the time of this planet, the time as we know it, will cease, and we walk straight into eternal time. But time isn't eternal. God is outside of time. <laughs> He's outside of space. And in a sense, even to put a time limit on eternity, you, you, you can't do that. Um, it's just eternal. So time is direction and duration. Our clocks, I'm looking at the clock, I've been on for about 15 minutes now. That's gone quick, hasn't it? And I'm only on page three, so I'll speed up. Can we speed up time? <laughs> Actually, you can, or you can slow it down. If you, if you go in Concord and you go around the earth, Actually, you slightly slow time down. So time is a very, very, time and space is a very, very strange and fascinating thing. But that's a digression. So our clocks mark change. Our timepieces, they are benchmarks of change. In other words, whenever there's a change of any, of any kind, we know that time has passed. The evening and the morning were the first day. Um, I, don't, I can't remember. What, what were we doing last, what, what were you doing last evening? Can you even remember what you were doing? Because it's gone. At the time you were doing it, but now it's over and it's finished and, and there's a new day started. You're in a new phase of time because time is always marching forwards and there's not anything that we can do about it. Time is forward. We cannot recover the minutes that have passed by. But what's amazing about time, both in terms of God and his word, the Bible, and in terms of human beings made in the image of God, is that God and humans, we like to mark time with significant events. We mark time in our history for the really big events. Time is marked by, well, Vesuvius is going off again, isn't it? So time is marked with Pompeii, Vesuvius, off went this uh, amazing um, uh, volcano, and it's in history as an important date. I don't know the date of it, I didn't look it up. But the one that's a big one for the Jewish people um, is AD 70 in today's time. AD 70, the destruction of Jerusalem, was the start of the diaspora. AD 70 is a date marked in Jewish history. And that has marked forward, and God has called them back 2,000 years later. So 1948 in Jewish history is another big marker. These are big markers in time. We, uh, in 19, for us, uh, in 1914, 1918, we marked time. It was the Great War. Uh, we marked time, 39, 45, another war. COVID would be a great marker of time. Uh, it will go down in history, uh, just like 1957 Asian flu. It's a marker in time. Some are bigger and some are smaller. God also marks time. He marks them with the big events in his Bible, such as, we've looked at some of them, the Tower of Babel, the pride of man. He brings them down and scatters them. Noah's flood, the Exodus. There are major events that mean something profound in God's history. Of course, the biggest one, I guess would be the birth and the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We live in a physical world with its four known, I don't know if they've discovered any more, 
but with currently four known space-time dimensions, length, width, height, or depth, and time. God dwells in a different dimension, the spirit realm, beyond the perception of our physical senses, although occasionally he lets us experience him, and we can sense him by the power of his Holy Spirit. God is, of course, not limited by any physical law. He's the one who put the physical laws into being. All we can do is to discover what God has already done. That's the realm of science. When did this happen? How long ago did the universe come into being? What are the processes? So we're uncovering how God did it. Um, Religion, of course, is asking who, who's the one behind creation and why? Why has he made it? And that's the realm, and I'm trying to bring some of these things together. Isaiah 57, 15 says this, for this is what the high and lofty one says, he who lives forever, whose name is holy, I live in a high and holy place, but also with him who is contrite and lowly in spirit, Isn't that amazing? God is outside of time, and he's an eternal creature. He's in the third heaven, and yet he can be with you and me, the humble of heart by the power of his spirit, because God is everywhere all the time. But what is God's relationship to time? Uh, John 4, 24 says, God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. So God, we know, is a spirit. In Psalm 90, verse 4, Moses used a simple yet a profound analogy in describing the timelessness of God. He said this, For a thousand years in your sight are like a day that has just gone by, or like a watch in the night. I think that's about six hours. So, well... A thousand years is like a day to God. But that gives theologians, that gives you and me a bit of a problem. Because when we think about God and time, and God says in Genesis 1-1, the evening and the morning were the first day, talking in our human time, and yet time to God at a thousand years is like a day, the danger of constructing scripture is to say, well, what God really meant was the days of Genesis 1 are actually massive time periods. That, of course, would allow for evolution, absolutely. Of course, that would allow, uh, it would say the earth is incredibly old. But is it really what the Bible is saying? And I'm going to show you that it isn't, and that we need to be very careful how we look at the concept of time within scripture and how God uses time when he's describing or doing things. Very, very important point. The marking of time, well, it's irrelevant to God because he transcends it, but he has also marked it. So it's, it, it's important to God. He has marked time in his word, the Bible, and he's done that for many reasons. In 2 Peter 3.8, Peter cautioned his readers uh, to be careful about time. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day. Very similar to what Moses said. But actually, he's cautioning, do not forget this one thing. And next week, when we look more, at the sixth day of creation, plus these issues, it will become very clear. I can't do it too much to do tonight. So as we continue to think about time, the Bible has effectively two two views of time, and actually I think you and I have two views of time. The first one is chronos, from which we get the word chronological. Chronos or chronological means it keeps moving forward. And there's the arrow moving forward towards the end of time. Examples of chronological time in the Bible would be 
the period or the time of the judges. It's the time of the judges. The period or time of the kings. Samson, David. Specific period of time in Jewish history. This is Kronos time. They lasted for a period of time and one transcended into the other from the judges into the kings. For us today, as I said last week, we live in the time of the church. We live in the church age. It's been going for 2,000 years. Actually, this is a big period of time. You know, 2,000 years. Jesus has not returned yet. And we are in the chronological age of the church. But it will come to an end. The church age will end and we'll move into a different time period. And then the Bible talks about Kairos time. And most of you will know what Kairos time means. Kairos means an appointed time, a specific time, a narrow window of time. Um, it is, uh, chrono, well, Kronos is found 54 times in the Bible. Uh, Kairos is found 85 times in the Bible. And it does mean a specific time, an appointed time, um, great events happen, God intervenes, something big happens in a Kairos moment. And of course, the big one of the Bible, which divides everything, is the Kairos moment, the advent of Jesus Christ. Jesus was born at an appointed time. Galatians 4.4 4 says this, but when the time had fully come, when the Kairos time had come, it was time now for a Kairos moment. But when the time, Kairos, had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under law. So we live in two periods of time, Kronos and Kairos. And we mark our calendar by the Kairos time of Jesus' birth, don't we? 2,000 years ago. There's some important key words, more on this uh, next week, some biblical views of time. A very important Old Testament word for time is yom. And yom means a set period. It's like kairos. It's a set period of time. It's a day. And the one that I hope you're already thinking of is the Jewish festival of Yom Kippur, Yom Kippur, the day, the day of atonement. The word Yom is found in the Bible 2,308 times. And looking through, not that I've looked through all 2,308 Yoms, but setting aside what people say and they're studying the Bible, they put things together, Yom always means a day or a specific day, like a kairos moment. A Greek New Testament word for time is hemera, and it means a period of time, but it can also mean a specific day. So yom, day, hemera, a period of time. So to God, it's hemera. A day is like a thousand years to you. It's not yom. A day, a thousand years to God is not, is not a yom. It's a hemera. And it's found 389 times in the Bible. When it comes to concepts that I'm trying to present to you, we need to know which time period we're talking about and what the Bible wants us to receive from the time period. Because if we mix them up, we can completely misunderstand Genesis chapter 1 and the six-day creation. When we think about eternity again, it's defined as no beginning, no end. It has endless time. And this is entitled the eternal earth. Although the earth had a beginning, but it will have no end. But this earth will have an end. So which earth are we talking about in the future? Is it this earth that's been reformed and transformed? Or does this earth completely disappear and a new earth come? The Bible talks about it is renewed. So the future earth, which is not this earth, but the structure of this earth will become the future earth. It will be renewed 
and it will be renewed by fire. So there's the foundation of this current earth, the foundation, and remember in Noah's flood, the whole earth was flooded 40 meters above the highest mountain. It's God's picture of baptizing or baptism of planet earth saying you will be redeemed, planet earth. You are, Romans 8, you're crumbling, you're falling apart, you're, you're groaning, you're waiting for the adoption of the sons of men, you're waiting for the kingdom to be fully formed and then your time will come. You will be renewed but you will be renewed by fire. So we already know that this current earth, the foundation, is going to exist. It will be renewed and different. The old has gone, the new has come, because it will be eternal. It will be incorruptible. Just like our human body, we are falling apart like this earth. We're groaning and we're straining, but there will be a renewal, a resurrection, and we will have a new body body like Jesus's that will last for eternity. So to give a hint about next week, when we look back to the earth, what was happening before Genesis 1-1, I will be proposing there was an earth. There was a previous earth. There was an ancient earth. There were things on it. There were creatures in it. The Bible describes it. And then something happened to it. And that's when we enter Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and void. Darkness was over the face of the deep. So there was something, the substance was already there. And that's what we'll be delving into. Because that's how, when we look at eternity, when we look at the earth in the past, the two things that the Bible says and what the scientists say, they harmonize actually rather well and that's what I'm going to try to do so I hope you've you're going to say I can't wait until next week comes and I'll be doing it pictorially and you'll see it unfold before your eyes and I hope that it will make an awful lot of sense so when we think about eternal past and eternal future eternity is a term to express the concept of something that has no end and no beginning and of course eternity describes God um, and we know all of that, so I can move on. Our destiny and everything about this current planet, what would happen on it, its history, how it would end, what would happen, was written or was known by God before the beginning of time. 2 Timothy 1, 8 to 10 says this. So do not be ashamed to testify about our Lord or ashamed of me, his prisoner. But join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God, who has saved us and called us to a holy life. Not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This is the gospel. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. So that is looking into the eternal past. God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, they coexist in unity for eternity. Father is eternal, the Son is eternal, the Spirit is eternal. And so, this grace, the grace of God is given to us in Christ Jesus in the eternal past from the very eternity. But now, but it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior, the Kairos moment, Jesus Christ, into the present time of the earth. Christ came. He walked on the earth. People could see him and touch him. He spoke. And in his present coming, who, Jesus, has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality, he's brought eternity to light for those who would believe in the gospel. So, eternity passed, God had a plan. The Kairos moment happens and that plan comes into present time and Jesus is the one who sets up eternal time for those who would believe. Fantastic, absolutely brilliant. 
when we think about the stuff of creation, and, and I know that this Bible study will challenge us. Um, it certainly challenged me when I first learned about all of this because I'm very much scientifically orientated, um, but I'm trying to be biblically orientated and put the two together. But it's by faith we understand, and I did this recently, so I don't need to spend much time. But it's by faith that we understand that the universe was formed at God's command. Let there be light. The evening and the morning were the first day. It's only by faith that we can believe that. And, um, you know, we can think of all the evidence, and I'll be presenting loads of evidence, but we have to choose to believe the word of God. We have to choose to believe it. So it's by, I mean, at the end of the day, no scientist was there in the beginning, and any good scientist will say, we know diddly squat about this universe. We actually don't know that much about it. Probably what we know would fit on the pinhead, on a pinhead, with all that there is to discover. And science has come a long way in 100 years. It's unbelievable how far it has come. And yet, how much further could it go? Nobody really knows. So it's by faith that we understand the universe is formed how God said it was formed. And that means the physical universe, the one that we are living in, that we can see it, we can hear it, we can feel it. And um, it was created not from any existing matter. There, there, there was no matter. In the beginning, God. God creates time and matter. There was no matter. And this is an insight, um, I think, into the scientific conundrum of what came before the Big Bang. We've probably all heard of the Big Bang, haven't we? We've all heard of a Big Bang, and, and of course, science has moved beyond the Big Bang. There are new theories, there are incredible theories, because there's still the question, what came before the Big Bang? Does the Big Bang explain everything? And of course, actually, we know that it doesn't. So we know that God created everything we know, and we know that God has told us what happened and how he did it, but it takes faith for us to believe it. The scientists will tell you that all known science, and David will correct me afterwards, <laughs> uh, but the scientists will tell you that all known science ceases to exist before the singularity of the Big Bang because they can't look beyond it. They can't look beyond the bang. And uh, so the scientists will tell you that whatever we know now, well, we haven't got a clue what was there before. Everything breaks down before let there be light. So they have their own conundrum. And just like we as Christians, we have uh, our conundrums as to how we see the story, the scientists also have their conundrum, how they see the story. And the scientists agree in big blocks there are many scientists who do not believe in an old earth or evolution. And I've told you before, uh, a, a designer, an intelligent designer, is a very big latest thing. All the evidence is pointing to the fact that there is someone outside of creation because there's an intelligence in creation that can't just spontaneously arrive. And so all of a sudden, scientists are they're describing the person of God but without calling him God, without making him a deity, because there might be more than one. I mean, they don't know, but they're on the similar page to us through their own discovery of science. And that means we live in a very exciting time, uh, doesn't it? We live in very exciting times. So I said that the Bible talks about two eternities. I'm going to draw this bit for you as we come to an end. Uh, just so you can see the type of thing I'm going to show you from next week. We're going to have quite a few slides building a picture, and I hope this is going to work. So we're looking at eternity and time. So my first line, I hope you can read it, eternal past, eternal future. We live between two horizontal times, if you like, between two kairos moments when God created the earth and when God is going to regenerate the earth. So we live between effectively two earths, but maybe there are three. 
So our current Earth, as I've said, at the end of time, at some point after 2023, it will be renewed and it will become eternal. Heaven comes down, New Jerusalem comes down, God who's outside of time, actually, in fact, actually, we step into his eternity. <laughs> we step into his eternity. And he will be our God and we will be his people and he's made his home on earth. So does that mean he's come out of the third heaven and he's, but then earth is eternal anyway. It's all part, it's all changed. There's a new heavens and a new earth. And so we live between the two horizontal lines that represent physical time and the physical time, space, and matter of the universe as we know it. And then we have Earth's history, don't we? We have the creation of the Earth to start with, the end of the Earth when God will purge the Earth by fire, and all of Earth's history. And you remember I, I said last week that you can only really go back 10,000 years. The oldest city is Damascus, and you know, every time you look at something, there seems to be this limit of 10,000 years, which happens to link with what the Bible says. But then how do you explain the dinosaurs? How do you explain the things that are found and discovered in the rocks, which seem to be really old, particularly if you do carbon dating? I will answer that starting from next week. And then, in Earth's time, we have a Kairos moment, when Jesus Christ is born, and he separates, he separates in that Kairos moment, he separates for us, biblically, the history of God and his people from the Old Covenant, the Old Testament, into the New Covenant and the New Testament within which we are now living. This is Kronos time. And that Jesus' arrival is Kairos time. Then there will be an end time. People are fascinated by end times, aren't they? People are really fascinated by end times. There's loads of books written about end times. Is, is the rapture pre-mid or pre-trib, post-mid, mid-trib? You know, is, is the millennium a real thing or is it not? The end times is fascinating. That's the stuff that's written in the Bible, which is future. And it's fascinating because we're trying to interpret the future. It's easy to interpret the past. It's not so easy to interpret what's happening in the future. And that's why there are so many different views on it. Because people look at scripture in different ways and they piece it together. I have a particular view because I tend to see the Bible in a logical format. And you will see that um, over the next few weeks. And so there is something that will happen in eternity. And then the thing that I'm really looking forward to is explaining the bit that happened immediately before this current earth. What was happening back here? What was happening? And I'll be unpacking that from next week. As I said, the Bible says a lot about end times. There'll be wars, famines, and earthquakes. All nations are going to turn against Israel. This is the Bible. The Antichrist will come. There'll be two witnesses. Who are they? Enoch and Elijah, or it's Moses. One. You know, who are they? Who are these people? There will be a rapture of the church, or there might not be a rapture of the church, depending on how you see the rapture. As I've already said, is there a literal millennium rule of Christ or not? Is it already here? Some church doctrines believe the millennium rule is already here, and they believe it started at the Kairos moment, AD 70, because it looked like tribulation. Everything came down on Israel. They ran, they fleed, they went to Petra, they got scattered everywhere. The whole place was flattened. And that changes how you perceive, how you perceive the earth, because if we are living in the rule and reign of Christ, then you and I are supreme. We're the greatest. We can do anything we want to do. We can walk on water. We can, because that's how the millennium rule is all subject to Christ and we will be ruling with him. But that's an eternal future anyway. That's later. But next week, we're going to build a picture of our earth 
Is it old? Is it young? Can both be true? We'll look carefully at Genesis 1-1, going verse by verse and word by word in places. The story of the eternity past and the creation of our earth will unfold. There will be some surprises, but I believe it all slots together and it makes sense. I hope by the end of this series you'll have a good understanding of the overview of the Bible, where we fit in, and that it will answer so many questions for you. Can I take it literally? Can I believe it? Or is Chris mad? Or is the Bible picture mad? You know, we will be challenged along the way. But you're up for a challenge, aren't you? And we always do some difficult subjects. So next week, it really gets interesting. And I hope to see you then. God bless you. Amen. Amen. Amen.